hope you're all doing fine in this video i would like to discuss a necrosis and various types of necrosis so basically necrosis is a death of a tissue in a localized area followed by degradation of that tissue because of release of various lytic enzymes from the dead cells present in that area and this is invariably followed by inflammation because inflammation again is nothing but a local response of a vascularized living tissue to injury and there are several agents which are responsible for necrosis so we have different agents which can trigger and cause necrosis so it can be hypoxia that is low oxygen tension it can be a physical agent or a chemical agent or it can be a bacterial related or it can be immunological related so we have several agents which cause necrosis no matter what the agent is irrespective of the cause of necrosis we commonly see two characteristic features in this kind of injury so necrosis is basically an irreversible type of cell injury we see a irreversible type of cell injury in necrosis so we have two characteristic signs evident in this kind of cell injury the first one is cell degradation and the second characteristic sign is denaturation of proteins present within a cell so this cell degradation and denaturation of proteins are commonly seen in this type of cell injury so this cell degradation as i have discussed in the introduction it's mainly because of the lytic enzymes which are present and released from the adjacent dead cells so as a result of this there is cell degradation and morphologically cells appear as to be having a homogeneous and intensely eosinophilic cytoplasm and apart from these changes within the cells there can be even vacuolation or calcification so this is one important feature which we find in this kind of injury and the second one is denaturation of proteins so there are certain characteristic changes happening within the nuclear material present within a cell which is which has undergone necrosis the first one is condensation of nuclear chromatin which is termed as pycnosis so this term is very important so pycnosis is nothing but condensation of nuclear chromatin material within a necrosed cell so this pycnosis can either lead to karyolysis or karyorhexis so karyolysis is nothing but dissolution of that nuclear chromatin material and karyorhexis is nothing but fragmentation of that chromatin material into various granular clumps so that's the sequel which we come across when there is denaturation of proteins within the cell pycnosis which can lead to karyolysis or karyorhexis so we have different kinds of necrosis broadly there are around five types of necrosis starting from coagulation necrosis colliquative or liquefactive necrosis caseous necrosis fatty necrosis and fibrinoid necrosis so now let's discuss in detail regarding all these types of necrosis now coming to the first type of necrosis that is coagulative necrosis so coagulative necrosis is the most commonly seen necrosis and it's mainly caused by ischemia ischemia is nothing but cessation of blood flow so this ischemia leads to a local injury which predisposes that tissue to coagulative necrosis 
So apart from ischemia, other causes of coagulative necrosis include bacterial related causes and chemical related causes. So even these are implicated in causing coagulative necrosis. And the organs where we commonly encounter coagulative necrosis is heart, kidney and spleen. So these are the organs where we commonly encounter coagulative necrosis. And coming to the gross appearance of a tissue which has necrotized in this manner. Initially, in the initial stages, this foci of coagulative necrosis appear as pale, firm and slightly swollen. But as it progresses, they appear to be more yellowish, softer and shrunken. So these gross changes really help us to identify the foci of coagulative necrosis. So as discussed, initially they appear pale, firm and slightly swollen, but as they progress, they appear more yellowish, softer and shrunken. And coming to the microscopic changes, which is very important, the hallmark sign for identification of coagulative necrosis is tombstone appearance. This is very important. A normal cell is converted into its corresponding tombstone. So tombstone is nothing but presence of intact cell wall with loss of inner material. So it can be either loss of nucleus or cytoplasm. So normal cells consider this to be a normal cell with nucleus and this is all cytoplasm with various organelles and this normal cell is converted into its corresponding tombstone where the cell outline is retained whereas the nucleus and cytoplasm are completely lost. So this is the characteristic feature, histologic feature of a coagulative necrosis. So because of this tombstone appearance, we are able to identify that particular tissue even though it has necrotized because the cell outline is still intact. And apart from that, a necrotized cell appears to be slightly swollen and the inner cytoplasmic content appears to be more eosinophilic. So this is the appearance of a necrotized cell. It appears to be slightly swollen and the cytoplasm appears to be intensely eosinophilic and most importantly, the nucleus present within the necrotized cell shows certain changes which are described previously. So we, we find pycnotic nuclei or we can even find carrier hexis or karyolysis within the cell. So these are some of the microscopic changes which we can anticipate in a necrotized cell. In summary, coagulative necrosis is the most common type of necrosis which we encounter. It's mainly caused by ischemia or cessation of blood flow or even bacterial and chemical agents are implicated in coagulative necrosis. Various organs where we can encounter coagulative necrosis is heart, kidney and spleen and gross changes it's usually pale, firm and slightly swollen and as it progresses appears to be yellowish, soft and shrunken. And microscopic features, the characteristic feature is tombstone appearance where the cell outline is retained even after the necrosis has happened and which really helps us to identify the nature of cell even when there is necrosis. And as I have discussed, there are certain changes happening within cytoplasm and nucleus and most importantly, cell degradation or liquefaction is not seen in coagulative necrosis. So that's the reason why I mentioned that the cell outline is still remaining intact. So there is no cell degradation or liquefaction. And at the end of the necrosis, these necrotized cells are infiltrated by inflammatory cells. And these are phagocytosed, leaving granular material and fragments of cells.
So that's the sequelae which we commonly anticipate at the end of necrosis, that is inflammation. So this is in brief about coagulation necrosis. Now moving on to the second type of necrosis that is liquefactive necrosis. Liquefactive necrosis is also called as colliquative necrosis. And the name itself indicates that there is liquefaction or degradation of cells and this degradation happens because of powerful hydrolytic enzymes which are released from the dead cells. So this liquefaction necrosis is caused by again ischemia. So ischemia is nothing but cessation of blood flow as I discussed previously. And other agents which are implicated for causing liquefaction necrosis are bacterial products as well as fungi. So these are the causes for liquefaction necrosis and the areas where we commonly encounter liquefaction necrosis is infarct brain and abscess cavity. So how does these appear grossly? As you all know Abscess cavity appears to be softer with central liquid material, right? So the gross appearance is It appears softer With central liquid material which mainly contains necrotic products and as time progresses Cystic lining is formed surrounding this liquid material and coming to the microscopic features this cystic cavity contains numerous necrotic products we have necrotic products and macrophages. So these macrophages contain phagocytosed material. Right, so the central area of this abscess cavity contains necrotic material with macrophages which further contain phagocytosed material. And this peripheral cystic lining contains numerous proliferating capillaries and inflammatory cells and most importantly if this kind of necrosis is seen in brain then we find gliosis so gliosis is nothing but proliferation of glial cells in the brain so if this necrosis happens in brain we find gliosis if this is seen in an abscess cavity instead of glial cells we find fibroblasts so rapidly proliferating fibroblasts surrounding the entire liquid material. So in brief, microscopic appearance, the central material within the cystic cavity contains necrotic material with macrophages and the surrounding peripheral rim of cystic lining contains numerous budding capillaries, inflammatory cells, glial cells in case if it's in brain or if it's an abscess cavity, then we find numerous fibroblasts lining the cystic cavity. So, in brief, this colliquative necrosis, also called as liquefactive necrosis, where we find degradation of cells because of powerful hydrolytic enzymes. It's caused by ischemia, bacteria and fungi, and it's commonly seen in infarct brain or in an abscess cavity. And gross appearance is something like this, which appears softer initially, containing liquid material inside. And as time progresses, there is cystic lining development. And microscopically, we can see numerous necrotic material within the center of this liquid material with macrophages. And this peripheral cystic lining contains numerous budding capillaries, inflammatory cells, glial cells or fibroblasts, depending upon the location of that necrotic material. Now coming to caseous necrosis, it's commonly found in the center of foci of tuberculous infections. It has features of both coagulative and liquefactive necrosis. As the name itself indicates, it has the appearance of dry cheese. It's caused by mycobacterium tuberculi. So it has bacterial cause, usually found in tuberculous infections and coming to the gross appearance of caseous necrosis as I said it has a dry cheese appearance so this dry cheese is nothing but yellowish 
granular and soft. This appearance is partly attributed to the histotoxic effects of lipopolysaccharide LPS which is present within the capsule of tubercle bacilli mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that's the reason why we have this dry cheese appearance. In coming to the microscopic features of caseous necrosis, usually it is structureless, eosinophilic, and granular. So that's how this necrosis appears microscopically. It's structureless, eosinophilic, and granular and it is surrounded by granulomatous inflammation. So a granuloma basically contains epithelioid cells interspersed with Langhans giant cells surrounded by peripheral mantle of lymphocytes. So that's the typical appearance of a granuloma and in the center of the granuloma we find caseous necrosis. So this entire necrosis is surrounded by granuloma. So to summarize caseous necrosis as the name itself indicates, it has, it has a dry cheese appearance. It has bacterial cause. It's commonly found in the center of foci of tuberculous infections. And it has dry cheese appearance, which is soft, yellowish, and granular. And this appearance is attributed to the lipopolysaccharides present within the tubercle bacilli, that is mycobacterium tuberculosis. And microscopically, it appears to be structureless, eosinophilic, and granular surrounded by granulomatous inflammation where there are epithelioid cells, Langhan giant cells surrounded by a peripheral mantle of lymphocytes. So that's a typical feature of a granuloma. Now coming to the fourth type of necrosis, fat necrosis. Fat necrosis is a special form of necrosis which is commonly seen in two anatomically distinct areas, one in pancreas and another one is breast. So it's seen in pancreas and breast. So in pancreas, when there is acute pancreatic necrosis and traumatic fat injury in breast, we find fat necrosis in these circumstances. So in acute pancreatic necrosis, pancreatic lipases are released and these lipases destroy the pancreas completely and also start at attacking the fat depots present within the peritoneal cavity. And this sometimes may extend into the extra abdominal fat tissue. So basically, when lipases attack a neutral fat, this neutral fat is converted into glycerol and free fatty acid. So we have fat on which if a lipase acts there is formation of glycerol and free fatty acid. So this free fatty acid might complex with calcium resulting in formation of calcium soap. So this process is called as saponification. So the moment because of some kind of injury or trauma there is release of lipase this attacks the neutral fat present within that particular area and converts that into glycerol and free fatty acid. This free fatty acid complexes with calcium forming calcium soaps and this process is called as saponification. Now coming to the gross appearance of fat necrosis it appears yellowish white. and the texture is firm. This is partly contributed or attributed to calcium soaps which are formed because calcium soaps impart chalky white appearance and also impart firmness to the entire focus of necrotic material. And coming to the microscopic features, the moment a fat cell is necrotized, it has a cloudy appearance.
and apart from the necrotized fat cell we even find calcium soap so this calcium soap appears histologically as amorphous granular and basophilic so this calcium soap histologically appears as amorphous material granular and basophilic So this is the histologic appearance of a fat necrosis. To summarize, fat necrosis is considered to be a special form of necrosis seen in two distinct locations. It's seen in pancreas in case of acute pancreatic necrosis and traumatic fat injuries commonly seen in breast. And the mechanism behind this fat necrosis is release of lipases because of injury or trauma which convert neutral fat into glycerol and free fatty acids which complexes with calcium forming calcium soaps through a process called saponification and macroscopically it has yellowish white and foam appearance and microscopically the fat cells appear to be having this cloudy appearance and this calcium soaps surrounding the fat cells appear to be having amorphous granular and basophilic structure histologically. So this is in brief about fat necrosis. Now coming to the fifth type of necrosis that is fibrinoid necrosis which is characterized by deposition of fibrin like material. It's commonly seen in arterioles in hypertension or it can be seen in peptic ulcer or it can be seen in immunologic tissue injuries such as Arthur's reaction, autoimmune diseases etc. And microscopically the necrotic material seems to be having brightly eosinophilic hyaline like deposition surrounded by nuclear material of neutrophils which is called as leukocytoclasis. So we have necrotic material which is brightly eosinophilic and hyaline like deposition surrounded by nuclear material of neutrophils which is leukocytoclasis. And most importantly there can be local hemorrhage because of rupture of blood vessels. So this is in brief about fibrinoid necrosis. So this is in detail about necrosis and we can have several questions either from the terms like pycnosis, karyolysis or karyorhexis or most importantly we can have several questions from the microscopic features of different kinds of necrosis. So this is about necrosis and various types. Thank you for watching.